Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, this week's topic is one I'm sure affects so many of our listeners. You might be eating well and exercising regularly, but do you still get afflicted and affected by the late night munchies? So many people do, especially over the course of the last 12 to 14 weeks or so. We're more stressed than ever before. And one of the easiest go-tos when it comes to stress is munching after you've had your dinner, before you go to bed, watching the news, watching a movie. It's a very common issue that people have. You'd be surprised how many people just do exactly that, reaching for their favorite crackers, crisps, biscuits, or whatever it is. And in today's episode, well, we thought we'd have a look at that and get tips and tools from an expert to give us some guidance. We're delighted to be joined yet again by consultant dietitian and founder of Dietetically Speaking, Maeve Hannon. She has appeared here before. She's a brand new book out called Your No-Nonsense Guide to Eating Well, and she'll give us all the tips that we need. Maeve, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on again. Not at all delighted to have you. So as I ask everybody this because I'm really interested. How have you been over the course of the last couple of months, changing times uh, for everybody, and how, how, how have things changed for you? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, there's been some challenges and uncertainty. Um, in terms of kind of day-to-day, you know, lifestyle, it's, you know, everything has really just moved online like it has for so many people. Um, but a lot of my work was online already. And um, so there, there wasn't a massive change in that. I guess, you know, some of the face-to-face work has moved more on telehealth onto the online space. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's nice to see things starting to open up again and we're getting you know, bits of normality back. And do you think that people do uh, munch, munch more when they get stressed? They go for the kind of finger food, the generally chocolate or crisps or something like that. Um, and when th- things are more stressful and you have a little bit more time in your hands, you pick more and you definitely eat more. Definitely. So, you know, it can be different emotions for different people, but stress would be a really common trigger for eating in a way that feels more uncontrolled or you know for some people it's kind of full-on binge eating where it's you know it's very uncontrolled it's maybe very rapid um, and people can feel extra guilty about that which can actually feed the cycle and then you know restart where you feel like oh I need to really pull back on my food I need to be really strict with myself and that's likely to trigger that type of eating again so I mean that's the more extreme end of the scale Um, but even on the less extreme end those that kind of underlying chronic stress which has been affecting all of us really over the past few months is likely to lead us to want to comfort ourselves with food and let's chat around the tips and tools to reduce that kind of comfort eating in people presumably it's an overall eating approach and improvement as opposed to you know just going for that one area and eating better during the day will reduce the the the, the need for comfort eating that's it exactly so really it's it's a symptom of you know, your overall intake and also your emotions. And so it's, it is that bigger picture view that really helps in the longer term. And as you were saying, one of the most common things I see if nighttime eating is an issue is people not eating enough in the early part of the day. So maybe skipping breakfast or having something very small to eat, maybe not having mid morning snack, or maybe lunch is quite rushed or quite small. And then, you know, for a lot of people, it's really from kind of lunchtime onwards or even dinner where they start to eat and they have their main intake. And sometimes it's just people are physically hungry. So they actually, um, you know, they, they want to eat for that reason. And then if you combine that with also, okay, now is my time that I relax. And a lot of people, the main way that we comfort ourselves and that we de-stress is using food. So if you combine those two things together of possibly not eating enough, having some physical hunger, and then also if there are some more difficult emotions coming up, um, both of those things can really lead to it being quite difficult at night time or just feeling like you don't have control in terms of what you're eating. Okay, so eat that little bit more and ensure you're getting enough food in during the day. And let's kick that off in terms of, I suppose, it's nice to bring people through a normal day in terms of breakfast options, snack options, and really simple lunch options. So let's kick it off with breakfast. What kind of food should people be eating? Yeah, so I think that's a really good idea to bring it back so it's more kind of practical and people have ideas. Um, So good breakfast options. So really, you know, for each meal, what we want to do is have a combination of each of our main food groups. So we want to have some starchy carbohydrates to give us energy. We want some protein and to make sure we're feeding our, that store in our body that will help with strength and muscle building. 
um, and then repair in general in the body. We want some of our healthy fats and we want some fruit and veg. So if you really think of those four key elements, we want those at each of our meals. So breakfast, lunch and dinner. So an example that we could have for breakfast. So in fact, the, the book I've just released, I've included 50 quick and balanced meal ideas. And some of them are just really simple because I wanted it to be as user friendly as possible. So, you know, one example of a breakfast is you have a whole grain wheat biscuit. So, you know, two of those and um, you'd have either ordinary milk or soya milk. And then you would have fruit and some seeds. So in that case, you're taking off each of those four. So you're getting your starchy carbohydrates from the cereal. You're getting protein in the milk and you're getting some fruit and then you're getting some healthy fats and you're also getting extra fiber and extra protein in the seeds as well. And are there any breakfast mistakes people make? I know with clients and myself, a lot of the time when they start, they will have a lot of smoothies for breakfast and things like that. Are there any kind of common mistakes people make for breakfast? Yeah, so a smoothie can be a really good breakfast. It just depends what you put in there and what the mistake I see with smoothies is people just putting in fruit and veg. So they're only getting one of those four elements. But if you make a smoothie where you have, again, say milk or yogurt or a bit of both, um, and then you have some fruit and maybe a handful of spinach as well, um, and then you have some carbohydrates, so it could be from banana or from oats, um, and again, maybe some nut butter for your healthy fats or some chia seeds. And if you blend up all of those, then you know that could be a really healthy balanced breakfast. But if it's just you know kind of like a green drink, then you're not going to get everything that your body needs to start the day properly. Okay. So eating regularly is one important thing. You kicked it off at breakfast. So presumably two or three hours later, you're heading into snack territory. Really simple snacks to have. What should people be having? And what shouldn't they be having? Yeah. So what I find is a really useful way of remembering this is you want to pair a plant-based food with a high protein food. So plant-based foods can be fruit or veg, um, but it can also be things like oat cakes or a slice of whole grain bread. You know, they're still plant-based foods. Um, so something like that. So you're going to get some fiber and you're going to get um, some energy and some vitamins and minerals if it's fruit and veg that you go for. And then pair it with something high in protein so that it's going to be more satisfying. It's going to keep you going for longer. And um, so it could be that you have some veg sticks with hummus or you have some berries with yogurt. Um, or it could be that you have, um, say, some oat cakes with a slice of cheese or again with some hummus or some cream cheese. Um, so that you sorry cottage cheese I meant higher protein um, so yeah so that's that's kind of a good rule of thumb so think about your plant-based food and your high protein food and it's just going to be much more satisfying because again a mistake that I see a lot of people see is they just have a piece of fruit but if you you know add a handful of nuts to that it's going to be much more filling and it's much more likely to get you to the next meal Okay, and that's another simple tip for people to take away. The protein does keep you fuller and aim to have protein with every meal that you have, ideally. Yeah. And, you know, A, for growth from repair, but B, for that kind of that fuller reason. And it'll stop your snacking during the day and later on at night too. Yeah, exactly. And it's also, it's just much more satisfying even when you're eating that meal. Um, and then you're getting all the goodness of protein. So there's lots of benefits. Okay, great. And then lunches and dinners, uh, give us some simple advice around that in terms of, I, you know, I know the, the plate concept tends to work really well about having certain amounts of your plate with salad and veg and then protein and so on and so forth. Yeah. So again, if we bring it back to those four main food groups, but we now apply it to lunch. And um, so having at least a third of the plate covered in salad or in veg, um, but, you know, up to half the plate is even better. Um, and then about a quarter being your, your whole grain starchy carbohydrate if possible. It doesn't need to be the whole grain option every time, but if we go for it most of the time, it's going to be really good for boosting our fiber intake. Um, and then about a quarter of the plate being the high protein food and then a little bit of healthy fats on top. So if we translate that into kind of a complete meal, it could be that you have two to three handfuls of salad. So just as much variety as possible. And um, so say for example, you have spinach and peppers and cucumber um, and maybe grated carrot. And then for your protein, maybe you have a chicken breast or a salmon fillet. And um, for your carbohydrate, then it might be, um, if you're making more like kind of a Mediterranean, maybe couscous salad, it could be couscous or it could be quinoa. Um, it could be maybe baby potatoes um, and then your healthy fat it could be maybe olive oil or again it could be a sprinkling of seeds on top 
Um, so that's just a really simple way of kind of, you know, taking everything off the list. But it can be a sandwich as well. I think a lot of the time we think a sandwich is bad for us or it's unhealthy. But again, if you're just taking off those four main groups, then it can be really healthy. So again, you could have your two slices of whole grain bread with maybe it's chicken or it's turkey. Um, and then you have, again, some salad in there. And um, then, you know, you're going to have some spread maybe on the bread. So you're getting some fats in there as well. But the only thing with that is it may be difficult to get enough fiber. So enough salad or enough veg, because if you think about the amount you would eat in a bowl of salad compared to what you can just fit into a sandwich. So basically having a, a piece of fruit with that can help to bulk up the amount of fiber that you're having. Okay, fantastic. And then of course, snack mid afternoon and then dinner, a similar kind of approach in terms of your dinner, a third, a third and a third. Let's chat about fluid and how important fluid is, because I know even in terms of hydration, it's important to making the right decisions and keeping kind of feeling fuller, having enough fluid is important as well. And it definitely leads to, if your fluid is poor, it definitely leads to increased snacking. Yeah, hydration is really important. Um, you know, as you're saying, studies show that even like 2% dehydration significantly increases how much decreases our concentration. Um, so you know, that impacts then our mood and just how well we're feeling in ourselves. Um, so for most people, it's about eight glasses of fluid a day we should be aiming for. So at least kind of around two liters, but that will depend. So, you know, if you're a bigger build or if you're very active, if you're in hot weather, then you're going to need more fluid than that. So a good way of calculating it is, um, and again, this is kind of your minimum, you take your body weight in kilograms, multiply by 35, and that gives you an idea of how much fluid you should be drinking in the day. Now, again, that can vary, as I said, you know, based on different factors. So really the best way of checking, am I actually having enough, is looking at the color of your urine and you want to be having pale straw, so light yellow colored urine means that you're well hydrated. If it's darker than that, then that's really your body telling you, okay, it's time to drink a little bit more. Okay, great. And in terms of practice and clients that you work with, talk us through some of the common mistakes that you see on a week to week basis. Um, that people are making in terms of food choices or even some of the diets people are I've seen loads of my friends doing it they've lost weight over the course of the last 12 weeks they've tried crash diets and lots of ridiculous diets I've seen them and I'm fascinated to get your opinion on what is around at the moment and the reason that they're not working yeah god there's so many to that kind of come to mind um some of the most common things I see because often I don't see like the really extreme approaches that much in clinic or when I'm working with clients it's more um kind of misconceptions around food so it's often demonizing carbohydrates in particular so trying i mean low carb diets are really popular and they've just come back in so many different forms over the years so if you think of you know we had you know atkins diet in the 80s and then it came back again and then like the paleo diet is like another form of low carb diet the keto diet um being a really popular one at the moment and again it's another another form of low carb diet which is extremely low carb um, you know, if you eat a banana on the keto diet, that can take you out of actually that ketosis. And um, so, yeah, so that's really, it's almost a carb-free diet. Um, so, so that's one of the ones I see most commonly, but actually carbs are really important. They're the main fuel for our body. So if we aren't getting enough carbs, I mean, our body can make energy from different places, but carbs are the best source of energy. So it's, you know, your brain and your muscles and your body can really function best when there's carbohydrates in your system. And then again, it's, you know, where we get a good intake of whole grains from. And if you're cutting out carbs or you're really reducing them, you may not be getting enough whole grains, enough fruit, and um, even other foods that naturally contain carbs like dairy, but are still really nutritious. You know, people can be limiting those kind of foods as well. So that's probably one of the most common ones I see. And sort of tied into that is this idea that sugar is toxic that we absolutely can never eat sugar and again that's just not the case you know our body does actually run off sugar and um, most of us eat too much sugar but you know there's, there's really you know a completely sugar-free diet is just not healthy because you know we get sugar in fruit and as i said in dairy and whole grains and even you know having the occasional cake and biscuits and things like that that's absolutely fine within an overall balanced diet there's no one food that is going to make or break your diet. It's that bigger picture of what you're eating most of the time. I think that's really important you know, for people listening in who do snack a lot, who have the late night munchies, you know, mm -hmm. don't try to cut everything out. There is place 
for chocolate or a biscuit or some crisps or whatever in a healthy, balanced diet and eating well, which, you know, ties in with the title of your book. There is, you know, a place for everything within that. And eating well is balanced and moderated. Exactly. So, you know, even when I talk about, okay, you know, this is the way you put together lunch or a snack or, you know, any meal. Basically, there's always a level of flexibility with that. And that's something that I really highlight in my book, that that flexible approach to eating is so important because part of eating well is your relationship with food. And, you know, food has a really important role to play in, um, you know, how we socialize, how we celebrate and food, you know, it can comfort us. It can make us feel better. And that in itself isn't a bad thing. It's when that's the only go to and it feels out of control or it starts to feel distressing, that's when it becomes a problem. And actually it's a sign that we need more. It's we need more coping strategies. We need, um, you know, possibly more hobbies or we need more support. It's not a sign that, you know, the food isn't really the problem. It's kind of a symptom of something else that's going on. Yeah, that was a question I was gonna ask you in terms of emotional eating. So a lot of people will, will you know, eat late at night for that reason. It's emotional, they may be upset, they're stressed, they're worried, they're, uh, sleep deprived whatever that may be and you know what are the best ways to handle that or are there any kind of tips that you can give for people who do eat that way yeah absolutely so you know one of the first things is really what we've already spoken about so if you focus on getting a regular meal and snack routine and you know having all those good nourishing foods in there then that can take away the actual physical hunger element later on which can make it much easier um, and then the other side as we're saying is emotional so this is something I do go through in my book that there are three main types of hunger to think about. So physical, as we've said, you know, when you haven't eaten in a while, that kind of hunger, it comes on slowly. And, you know, you, you'll know that feeling of just, you know, you're feeling low in energy and your tummy's grumbling. Um, and then another type of hunger is taste hunger. So that's one we haven't mentioned yet. And that's really that you just crave a certain specific taste and it could be that, you know, you really just want a little bit of something sweet or something crunchy or salty or fruity. Um, and that's often the case if you're, if you've been too restrictive with your diet, if you're not getting enough variety in. So as we were saying, if you put certain foods completely off limits because you think that certain foods are good or bad. So there's no such thing as good or bad food, good or bad foods, uh, just balanced or unbalanced diets. But if you say, okay, even though I love chocolate, I never let myself eat it we're much more likely to start to crave that because first of all, we have a psychological restriction in place. And it's almost like, you know, if you think, okay, try not to think about a giraffe, you'll just automatically be thinking about a giraffe. It's, it's just, you know, it's how we work. Um, but also you, you can just miss the taste of something. But with that type of hunger, what you'll notice is a small amount will be satisfying. So if you, you know, you really want some sweet and you have, you know, a few squares of chocolate, you eat it mindfully, you enjoy it that's satisfying and then you can move on with the rest of your day whereas with emotional hunger that comes on very suddenly and food will never fully satisfy emotional hunger so sometimes you know in the short term you'll feel a little bit better but in the longer term it's not getting to the root cause so one of the first steps is actually identifying okay is this physical is this taste is this emotional hunger and once you know which one it is, then you can learn, okay, well, what's the best way to respond to this? So if it's emotional, what is the emotion? So first of all, you need to identify specifically what that emotion is. And there's a few different ways of doing it. Um, there's a few acronyms. So HALT is the one that would be most commonly used. And that's just, am I hungry for H? Um, am I angry? Am I lonely or tired? One that I use with my clients sometimes is BLAST, so B-L-A-S-T-S. And um, because they're the most common emotions that I see coming up around emotional eating, and that's boredom, loneliness, anger, sadness, tiredness, and stress. But you can actually, if you Google emotional eating, oh, sorry, emotions wheel, there's, there's a really detailed wheel and it lists off all different types of emotions. And that can help you to really pinpoint, okay, what am I feeling? And then that can help you to try and figure out, okay, if it's actually boredom, what should I do? Is food the best solution to being bored? Or is there something else I can do? It can be quite difficult to do that in the moment if you're sort of caught up in it. Um, and especially if it's actually binge eating that's happening. But even if you can reflect on it afterwards and sort of plan for the future, okay, this is what happened. Try not to be too judgmental with yourself. And if that's to happen again, what are my options? 
Okay, great. So take a step back before you eat that food. That blast one is really good. Just, just remind us of the, of the, the what, they, what it stands for again. Yeah, so it's boredom, loneliness, anger, sadness, tiredness, and stress. Really good. So folks, try that the next time you're reaching for the, the, the biscuits or the reaching for the crisps and run through that little acronym. It's a really nice little acronym. It's, it's good. I haven't heard it before. It's cool. It's great. Um, one of the questions we get asked all the time, there's two big ones that we get asked on the show, people emailing in. One is that, the, is there a time that people should stop eating at night in terms of, you know, a, di- a, a, a larger meal, so a dinner or something like that? Mm-hmm. And that's the first question. And the second one is around people who train late in the day. So again, even when I do Instagram TV questions, People are always putting them in, oh, you know, I finished training at nine o'clock. What do I eat? What's the best food to have? So I thought we'd touch on those two things as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so really, it is a myth that there is a specific kind of magical cutoff that you can't eat after because it's so individual. And the second part of that question just really highlights that because if somebody's training in the evening, they absolutely need a recovery meal. We don't want them going to bed without having that recovery, you know, your body's going to need that protein for repair and it's going to need to replace some of the energy that's been used up as well. Um, So yeah, so in that case, absolutely, somebody should have a recovery meal when they're training later on. There is evidence that for most of us, it's healthiest to eat most of our food in the earlier part of the day. So the bulk of your food should be kind of before 3 p.m. And that's because the way our body clock and our circadian rhythm works that's kind of how we're designed to be. So, you know, if you think about it, if we didn't have electricity and lights and things, most of the time we would be eating our food in the daylight. Um, so that's, you know, possibly the reason why our circadian rhythm is that way. Um, so there's some evidence that if we are eating most of our food earlier on, it's kind of better in terms of our overall health and our sleep and our risks of certain diseases. But that's kind of, that's kind of the top level. So really what's most important is what you're eating in the day, your relationship with food and then you know for some people adding in that extra level of okay I'll try eat most of my food before 3 p.m but that doesn't mean no food after 3 p.m at all it just means you're having a good nourishing breakfast lunch you're having a mid-morning and a mid-afternoon snack so that's you know two meals and two snacks you're already having before 3 p.m if you're eating in the way that we talked about earlier um so I guess you know the way a lot of us eat in Ireland is the opposite way around where we eat very little and then we would you know eat quite a big dinner and then possibly the snacking into the evening if you do turn that on its head it does seem to be better for health uh, but everyone is different so there's absolutely exceptions to that okay and final question again it's something that comes in all the time is there an intermittent fasting still very trendy lots of people doing it just tell us your thoughts on that and maybe explain for people exactly what it is yeah so intermittent fasting is a way of it's a, a type of dieting basically where you don't really restrict the food that you eat, but you, you adapt your timings of when you're eating. So there's two ways of doing it where you either have certain days where you eat very few calories. So like the 5-2 diet, where there's maybe two days a week where you only eat about 500 calories or there's daily intermittent fasting. And that's where you have an eating window. So you might eat all your food within eight hours. So that's like the 16-8 diet. Um, so kind of similar to the research I was talking about in terms of body clock, there is some evidence that for some people, especially those who be maybe at higher risk of diabetes, um, there may be some benefits to eating most of the food early on, as I mentioned, um, and possibly then, you know, having a fast from the kind of evening until the next morning. Um, but really what I should say about that is, I mean, most of the evidence around intermittent fasting has been done in animals or in males and in athletes. And um, so we don't have a very robust evidence base that we can apply to a lot of the population. And there is some evidence coming out that actually, especially for women, it may not be beneficial for the way that our hormones work. Um, and I know, again, from just experience from working with people that women often find it much more difficult Um, And that could just be a sign that actually, you know, the body needs more regular nourishment. Um, So it's not something that I regularly recommend. You know, some people find it works for them, um, but there are kind of gentler approaches to it. So if you're eating really in the way we spoke about, and maybe your first meal of the day is maybe 8 a.m. And then your last snack is 8 p.m., then you're eating within 12 hours and then you're fasting for 12 hours. And that is actually a type of daily intermittent fast. And then some people take it a step further and they eat within 10 hours and fast for 14 hours. Um, 
So those kind of ones I feel can be more manageable, again, depending on someone's routine. But again, for athletes especially, um, it's often unhelpful to try and fast in that way because really you need to be getting in your protein hits. You need to be having your recovery meals. Um, you know, you may need your carbohydrate hit before training. Um, so there's lots of situations where it doesn't work. Okay, fantastic. So listen, as ever, thank you for uh, giving us your tips around avoiding the late night one, two, some really simple, effective tips that will work for people there, which is great. If people want to find out more about you and uh, where to buy your book, where can they find out all about that? So my website is dietheticallyspeaking.com. Um, and I've linked to my book on there um, on social media as well. I'm at dietetically speaking. Um, and again, in my bio, I've linked to the book. Um, you can just go on Amazon as well and just search for your no nonsense guide to eating well um, and the book itself. So it goes through really my top tips in terms of main nutrition advice. And I really try to simplify it, bring it back to basics um, and then just lots of practical tips around food shopping and meal prep, the 50 healthy meal ideas, as I mentioned. Um, and one really important chapter around mindset, um, and that's about trying to be a food realist rather than a food perfectionist. And it's all about that flexible, healthy relationship with food. Fantastic. Well, listen, the very best of luck with the book and the very best of luck with the big move in the future. I know you're making some big changes in your life based around COVID, so the best of luck with them. And as always, we'd be delighted to have you back on Real Health at any time in the future. Maeve Hannon, thank you so much for joining us, folks. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. It's going to be a really popular episode. Loads of people eat and have the late night munchies, and those tips will help you to avoid the worst of the pitfalls. As ever, you know where we are, Real Health at Independent.ie, at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram. And as always, don't forget to rate and review. It's much appreciated. Have a fantastic week. No more late than munchies. And we'll see you next week. So long. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.